previously on Desperate Housewives. Hi guys, it's Lauren Daisy. Welcome back to my channel and today we're going to be doing a Desperate Housewives video because I feel like, you know, we've been talking about Pretty Little Lies a lot recently in Gossip Girl, which I absolutely adore, but I did a poll if you guys ever want to, you know, know what's going on i usually do polls over on my community tab and you guys asked for more desperate housewives content and obviously i'm going to provide because i adore desperate housewives and more people need to watch it so if you subscribe to my channel for other shows and you haven't seen desperate housewives yet then you need to watch desperate housewives and join in on all the fun with us but today i am going to be ranking all of the desperate housewives mysteries so how Desperate Housewives works is every season we start off with a new kind of big mystery for that season. So we've got eight to go through today that runs along the whole season and then, you know, you kind of get the big reveal at the end. So I thought it would be fun to go through and talk about these and rank them from the ones that I felt were the worst or the weakest to the ones that I absolutely loved, the best of the best, the creme de la creme, the ones that I enjoyed the most. So coming in at number eight, I have the Apple White storyline from season two. And I don't think this is going to be an unpopular opinion. I think Across the board, people generally accept that this storyline is very problematic in the way that it was written and the way that it was handled. At the end of season one, we see a new family move on to Wisteria Lane, and that is the Applewhites. And we have Betty, the mother, and we have Matthew, the son. And when they first move in, um, there's a little bit of suspicion around them and kind of they're kind of isolating themselves from the other neighbors and it seems like they kind of have something to hide it is then revealed that betty is actually keeping her other son um who has learning difficulties they're keeping him locked up in their basement um literally chained to the bed and this is because they believe that he was the one who murdered matthew's ex-girlfriend when they lived in chicago i think it was and so they feel that he's a danger and they keep him locked in the basement. But as the season goes on, the story starts to develop a little bit more and we actually get the big reveal that Matthew was the one who killed her and not Caleb. Once this is revealed, he threatens Brie, I think it is, or Danielle, and the police actually end up shooting him and killing him at Brie's house. So like I said, this one is just incredibly problematic for a number of reasons. Um, I think it's a real shame because there is a big issue amongst Desperate Housewives in terms of people of colour. We do not get that many characters of colour in this show. So the one time that we actually did get a black family in this show, they were just kind of mistreated and written poorly. And as well, I think that uh, Betty Applewhite, who was played by, I think it's like Alfre Woodard? I think I'm, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Her acting was absolutely incredible. I cannot fault her for that. She was just amazing with what they gave her. And I just wish that either they had kept them to be able to write them into a better story and kind of rectify that, or they had just completely changed the storyline and she just got to be given a much better role in the show because I think she was just so incredibly talented. I think at its core, the idea that one brother is accused of a murder and then it actually turns out to be the other brother is a good storyline like at its core but i just think the way that they went about it was just really bad and the reveal that it was matthew was genuinely shocking so it's not that it wasn't dramatic in that sense but just everything else combined i feel like everyone just kind of agrees it's it's a low point for the series at number seven i have alejandro's death and this is from season eight so the final season and i i struggle okay because i never want to be one of those people that's like oh the earlier seasons are so much better than the later seasons because i don't always believe that to be true and for me i think the desperate housewives was good completely throughout i absolutely adored it the whole time but I do have to say that the actual mystery element of this season is definitely one of my least favourites. So for this one, we've kind of heard about Gabrielle's stepfather and how he abused her throughout the, throughout the series. And then it is revealed that he was actually alive. 
she thought that he had died but he's actually alive and he comes back and so when he tries to threaten Gabrielle in the house Carlos hits him over the head with a candlestick and accidentally kills him and this season is about the girls taking his body and burying it all four of them and then all of them kind of being involved in this murder and trying to cover it up. And that's basically this whole season. It's just, are they going to get found out? Are they not? And ultimately, Karen McCluskey ends up taking the fall for this because she is going to die in a few days anyway. So she takes the fall for the girls and they end up going free. And I understand what they were trying to do with this dynamic. They were kind of trying to flip it because usually it is the four girls like trying to figure out the mystery and solve the clues and everything and we're kind of watching along also trying to figure it out but this time it's flipped in that they are the ones that have caused this big mystery and everyone else in the show is trying to figure it out so I understood where they were going with it I just don't think it paid off for me I feel like when initially when Brie had received that note which was identical to the one that Mary Alice received I was really excited because I love, you know, callbacks to earlier seasons. So that was a really good moment. But I think after that, it just kind of went downhill for me because one of my favorite, personal favorite parts of this series, and I think you'll know that if you watch my videos, is the female friendship element of this. It's why I love Pretty Little Liars so much. And I just think that by dividing the girls in the way they did in this season it just made me like it less because I really love their friendship that's for me the heart of the show so to see them all fractured and turn on Brie and all this stuff I just didn't really like that we also had you know Carlos and Susan's guilt which obviously you would feel guilty and that's fine but I just feel like it got kind of annoying and then when Susan painted those painted that picture of them over the body I was like are you serious and her whole art storyline I've always just found to be dull so when that started getting more airtime I was like I don't know if this is a season for me I also feel like with other ones it the mysteries are the central theme of that season but that kind of splits off because usually it's not actually to do with the girls specifically right as we go through, you'll see it's usually to do with other people that have moved to the lane or husbands or whatever it is. And the girls kind of like figuring it out, but they're also following their own stories in the meantime, right? Whereas this time, I felt like we didn't really have that. Everything was centered around this death. And I think that's where they lost me because I didn't, because I wasn't enjoying this part of the show so much. There wasn't really anything else I could focus on to enjoy instead. So yeah, which is a real shame because it is obviously the last season, but we have a lot of other good ones to talk about. So, you know, they can fumble a few of them. It's okay. Okay, guys, I am sick. <laughs> sick. And um, that's why I look a little bit more rough than I just did in the last clip. But I'm also going on holiday, so I was like, I gotta get, I gotta get a video up, you guys, before I leave. So watch the ads on this video. Do your girl a favor. <laughs> I look so rough. My nails are chipped because I haven't done them yet in preparation for my holiday. And also, I swear I don't just wear this hoodie all the time, but I feel like on my channel lately it seems like I do. I feel like my hair, even though it's in a claw clip, is kind of giving like Ray from Star Wars. I once did that for work. And it was a sleigh. I feel like maybe I should try that hairstyle again. Anyway, back to the video. Apologies for how my voice sounds. We're just gonna have to rock and roll with it. Okay? Nice. So at number six, I have Catherine Mayfair. And this is the big plot line of season four. So Catherine is actually somebody that Susan knew way back when, when she first lived on the lane. The order that they move onto the lane is Mary Alice, then Susan, then Brie, then Lynette, and then finally Gabrielle. So this is just after Susan has moved in and before Brie has moved in. So Susan was the only one that knew Catherine and obviously Mary Alice. And so she comes back to the lane. And now when she lived here before, she lived with her husband, Wayne, and their daughter, Dylan. And Dylan was friends with Julie. So she's moved back and they kind of get this feeling that Dylan isn't, she's a little bit different 
And when Julie's talking to Dylan about stuff they used to do together, Dylan doesn't really remember it. So everyone's a bit like, what is the deal here? Catherine's acting a little suspicious, right? We then find out that the real Dylan actually died when she was a kid. And what had happened was... Wayne was abusive to Catherine. I don't, I can't remember if he was abusive to Dylan as well. I think it might have just been Catherine. And something had happened where someone, I can't remember who it was. I can't remember if it was Catherine or Wayne. I'm going to have to check the clip. But one of them put Dylan's toy on top of the wardrobe. And Dylan attempting to get her toy down accidentally pulled the wardrobe on top of her and it crushed her and that was how she died and Catherine didn't want to tell anybody about this and she also wanted to escape from Wayne's abuse I think was how it lined up so she actually fled she left and she went to Romania and adopted a little girl who she felt like looked like Dylan and then brought her back and raised her as Dylan and Wayne thinks that this daughter is actually his daughter so she he kind of tries to get back involved and it basically ends with Dylan finding out the truth about who she really is and also Catherine ends up shooting Wayne that's kind of like the big reveal at the end so for me I actually really like Catherine's character I mean the, she goes to some crazy places in the seasons after this but I actually preferred her after this season when she first showed up she was kind of cocky and they had that competition between her and Brie whereas I actually really liked when all of that was done and her and Brie became partners I thought that was a really nice friendship that they had there so yeah I preferred Catherine after this season I found her a little bit unlikable in this season I didn't warm to her as quickly as I did some of the other characters that they bring into the show. I think the reveal was dramatic. I mean, when they actually showed the flashback of what happened to Dylan, me and my boyfriend were like, Jesus Christ, that's intense. And so it was impactful in that sense. And also Catherine kind of getting her revenge on Wayne and that whole dynamic um, was really intense. But I just feel like it, at a point it got a little bit convoluted and unbelievable. And I know that, you know, quite a bit of Desperate Housewives has that element to it. It's very, like, camp. If you've never... I've done a Wade Watch this video if you've never seen it. But if you've never seen it, it's so, like, kind of, like, dramatic and, like, you know... It's almost, like, so proper, like, that kind of vibe sometimes. But I feel like a lot of people also have this criticism about this storyline. That how would she get Dylan to truly believe that she was her mum? Because at this point, she's, like, five or six. If she'd been, like, a baby, I feel like it would have made more sense for her to not really know that she had been swapped out but like at what point did she genuinely believe that Catherine was her birth mum and not her adoptive mum and also like surely when she brought her over from Romania she would have had you know she would have spoke Romanian and she would have had a Romanian accent and I just find it kind of weird that we're expected to believe that she just magically you know, learn English super fast so that Catherine could, like, blend her back into her life. And, like, I don't know. I feel like those things are a little bit hard to believe. Um, but, you know, I still did very much enjoy this season. And I think, like I said, this is... I'll probably do a different episode. A different episode? Of <laughs> I just watched too much TV. Um, I'll probably do a different... <laughs> video where I actually rank the seasons because I think that would be a different ranking to the mysteries themselves because like I said aside from obviously season eight these seasons have a lot of other stuff going on in them which I do really like so yeah I definitely liked season four more than just the actual Catherine center storyline um but I did still enjoy it um like to a certain extent Okay, at number five, I have Paul Young. So this is not actually, this isn't the original story from season one. This is actually Paul Young's revenge. Okay, Paul Young strikes back. And this is from season seven. And basically, Paul has been in jail for these other seasons, right? And then he gets out because it's revealed that Felicia actually isn't dead. He's in jail for her murder. But they find out that she was faking her death and therefore Paul is released, right? And he moves back to Wisteria Lane and he wants to basically destroy Wisteria Lane. Man is on a mission. And because of that, his tactic is... See, I 
didn't know anything about this because to my knowledge, maybe I just don't live in this kind of community, but in my experience living in the UK, I don't know if we have this, but in America, apparently, I always love this. I, always, I think I've said this before, but like on my Aria's A video, I think it was, um, and my Alison De Laurentiis video, I always call out to the Americans <laughs> to teach me about these things. And you guys always come in clutch in the comments and I always learn so much from reading your comments. So I absolutely love them. But apparently there is this thing called the Homeowners Association, right? Or something like that. I can't really remember what it's called. Is it the Homeowners Association? Basically, because they all live on Wisteria Lane, right? When things come up that they have to vote on, everyone gets one vote per house, right? And you, I feel like it's kind of a weird, like, concept because you think that just the person that lives in the house would get one vote, but no, you get a vote per house. And so Paul's plan is to propose that they make some of the houses halfway houses um, which basically means that people that have just come out of prison can live there and and obviously everyone else is outraged by this right but what he does is he goes around and buys the houses right he buys the houses from people he buys one from mrs briggs from mike Arley. he buys one from bob and lee which was like a big reveal that they had caved and sold him the house oh be real some other people i can't remember but basically that was his plan right and then because he owned like six houses or something crazy he got six votes because he owns the houses it doesn't matter who lives in them he gets the votes which to me when i was watching this me and my boyfriend were like this is such a crazy concept like i need to know more about this americans i need you to tell me more about this concept because basically here at least where i live anyway Everything's kind of decided by the council. Like, people don't really get a say. You kind of just vote for who you want to be your, like, council representative. And then I think you have, like, neighbourhood, like, committees and stuff. I'm not involved in my local neighbourhood politics. I don't want to. So uh, maybe I'm just completely out of the loop on this. And this is something that we do. But it's not something that I know about. So anyway, that was a long, convoluted explanation. But that's the tea. Paul is buying up all these houses so that he can basically, you know, ruin Wisteria Lane and turn all of the neighbours against each other, right? Because obviously when someone sells their house, like when Bob and Lee sold their house, they became public enemy number one against everyone else who was against it, right? I know a lot of people don't like this one. But for me, Paul is my guy. I love that man. <laughs> like, he's so shady. Like, he is so shady, but honestly, I live for it. And like, he's actually hilarious. I feel like he's underrated. Nobody's talking about the hilarity of Paul Young because this man just has so much sass that lives within his bones and he's just so deadpan and it's so funny. And I love him. And I feel like he shows up and shows out. Anytime that Paul does something crazy, it's always a jaw-dropping moment. Like when he survived, when you thought that he had died in prison, like in that van on the way to prison, and then he turned out to still be alive, that shit was crazy. When he got out of prison, moved back to the lane, that shit was crazy. Like, he's always, he's always doing the most, and I love that for him. So the fact that Paul was back, that immediately gave it points for me, right? And honestly, the plan of buying up these houses so that he would have the majority vote was pure evil genius. And I was here for it, okay? I was like, you get those houses, Paul. Like, <laughs> like team pool because i wanted to see the chaos that was going to ensue and not only do you have this happening because of this storyline you also have him and his new wife who's beth young right and the drama of that and beth not being accepted by the other housewives but then you actually find out that beth is felicia's daughter okay the person that framed paul young for murder because she was trying to avenge the death of martha Huber because felicia and martha right they were sisters and then <laughs> I feel like I'm explaining, like, gossip to my, <laughs> my best friend Miranda or something. I'm like, and basically this is what happened, right? You're never going to believe it. So, <laughs> so basically, you had Martha Huber, right? And then that her sister was Felicia. Felicia then faked her death so that she could send Paul to jail for murder because he technically is a murderer because he murdered Martha, but he she couldn't pin it on him, right? So then he was in jail for Felicia's death, okay? Then, obviously, when Felicia is discovered to be alive he paul gets let out and you kind of think that's the end of that 
and she goes into jail for faking her own death, I think, basically. And um, then we find out that Beth Young, Paul's new wife, is Felicia's daughter and has basically been sent in undercover to take down Paul. It's crazy. But then she actually starts falling in love with Paul and then that is the craziness of it all, right? And it all, like, ends the Beth Young storyline with her ending her own life because she feels so guilty about everything and being part of this whole thing so that she can give Susan her kidney because Susan, oh my God, I forgot about that as well. So basically what happened was because of Paul and his antics, right? That a riot broke out on Wisteria Lane. Okay, a full on riot broke out on Wisteria Lane and I'm gonna do a whole video about the disaster episodes from Desperate Housewives and like ranking them because the disaster episodes from Desperate Housewives are so crazy. You guys don't even know. Well, if you've seen it, then you know. But anyway, so the disaster episode for this season was a riot. And in the riot, Susan got like knocked over or something had happened to her. And I think it like burst her kidney or like some something got real damaged and she ended up having to have dialysis. So she's basically waiting for a replacement, right? Um, she's on the donor list and oh that it's got to be kidney because like, everyone gets tested to see if they're a match right and Beth finds out that she is a match and so she then ends her own life so that Susan can get her kidney straight away and that Susan can live right craziness then what stems from this is Susan then feeling indebted to Paul because obviously Paul now lost his wife so that Susan could live so then she starts getting this budding friendship with Paul which is crazy and such a weird dynamic and then she has that dream about him in the shower and that was crazy and then Felicia is back in the picture she moves in across the street she moves in at Mike's house right so now she's got big beef with um Paul because she's like not only did you kill my sister but you led to my daughter's death so she's like on full blown like she's ready she's out for blood so she then fakes like she's like everything's cool you know I've made my peace with Paul but she hasn't so what she does is Susan is taking him food like every day and basically like befriending him because she feels guilty right so then what Felicia does is she starts poisoning the food that Paul is that Paul is eating. She poisons it at Susan's house and then Susan takes it to Paul to cut ties with Felicia from it, right? And then what is so crazy about this and how and then Susan finds out that this is happening, right? Because Paul almost dies and they're like you're being poisoned. How are you being poisoned? And he's like, "Oh my god, it's Susan. Susan is poisoning me, right?" So he accuses Susan of poisoning him. And then Susan realizes that it's Felicia because obviously she knows she's not poisoning this man, right? She got no beef. She got no qualms with this man. So then she has just made brownies and they were supposed to go to Paul but Paul's too sick. So then she sent them to a kids fundraiser instead. So she has to go in there and be like, "These brownies are poisoned. The brownies I bought are poisoned." which was just insane, absolute insanity. And then basically Felicia ends up holding Paul hostage in Susan's house and tries to kill him. And then um, Susan comes in and saves him. And then Felicia like flees the scene, but then she ends up dying anyway because she crashes her car into an un oncoming truck. <sighs> that was a lot. I hope you followed along there. Go back and watch it again if you need if you need it to sink in again because I feel like I just shot so much information out of you. But basically, that is why I think this storyline slaps and people should appreciate it more because they just think of the homeowners association bit or whatever it's called, which was like low key genius. But I guess you could call it a little bit boring. But everything that stems off from it, that shit's crazy. Oh my god! And then he gets shot. Paul gets shot in the riot. I literally forgot about that. Wait, did the poisoning happen? No, it must all happen in season seven because I don't think Paul was even around in season eight. I'm sure that, yeah, I'm sure that was season seven. And yeah, during the riot, I'm pretty sure Paul gets shot. And they think it could have been Mike and then it could have been a couple of other people, but then it turns out to be Zach. Okay, Zach Young, who we haven't seen for a few seasons. This is what I love about Desperate Housewives, right? Because I think people liked being on this show. And so you get so many good returns from like big characters because and then people just love coming back to the show and it makes for such good tv and yeah zach shot him i forgot about that that was also crazy and yeah like the neighbors turning on each other like that was crazy 
And yeah, just like this character development of Paul from being all like vengeful to then actually being remorseful. I tell you, that shit was so well written. So well written. <laughs> all this gossiping isn't helping my sore throat. At number four, we have the Angie slash Eddie storyline. And I say this because they're very big plot lines that occur in the same season. So they're kind of like two big mysteries for this season, but they do also like intertwine and connect. So I'm just going to count them both as season six. So the first of these mysteries is the Bolan family. And they move to the lane. We've got Danny Bolan, Angie Bolan, and I always forget the dad's name. Nick. Right, Nick. So we've got Nick the dad. Uh, Angie the mom, and then we have Danny the kid, right? Well, he's a teenager. They move to the lane and everyone's real suspicious about them, right? Then we find out that the dad, Nick, is actually having an affair with Julie. So that's crazy tea right there. So that's kind of how everyone's intertwined, right? But then we also have the Fairview Strangler, right? That storyline is running alongside this. And they're kind of intertwined because Julie then becomes a victim of the fairview strangler but she lives and so they think that maybe it was danny like trying to get revenge because she'd had an affair with his dad or maybe it was the dad who wanted to kill her off because he didn't want angie finding out about his affair so you see what i'm saying they're very like linked but they're actually not linked at all <laughs> but they make it seem like they are to create even more suspicion around the bolan family and eventually what we find out is they're on the run and these aren't their real names and that Danny's real dad is not Nick. It's actually a eco-terrorist boyfriend, follow with me here, that Angie had years and years ago. And he's played by um, John Barrowman, which was crazy shit because I'd only seen him on like This Morning and I'm a celebrity up until this point. So I was like, Ariana, what are you doing here? And they create this whole mystery around him and that he's a really dangerous guy. And we get some really intense scenes where like he comes to Fairview and actually starts befriending Danny where he works at the coffee shop before Angie can find out about it and it's like it's mad it's mad and alongside that the Fairview Strangler then starts kind of racking up multiple victims like a girl that works at the coffee shop um and uh you know just uh Preston was gonna get married or was it Porter I can't remember I think it's Preston or is it Porter I think it might be Porter mm. Maybe it's Porter. Um, it's going to get married to this girl, but Lynette does not approve. The girl ends up being murdered by the Fairview Strangler, right? So it's like, who the hell is this man? Like, he's just going for all these victims. It doesn't matter. There's nothing really, like, connecting them, aside from the fact that they're all women. So then the Angie storyline concludes when Patrick, I think his name is the eco-terrorist boyfriend, he actually comes to the house and tries to, he threatens to blow up the house with Danny inside. And Angie is able to outsmart him by putting the bomb actually in his car. So then when he detonates the bomb, it goes off inside of his car, but he obviously thinks it's going to go off at the house. And he dies and then Angie and Nick, yeah, Angie and Nick move to like redo their lives. Whereas Danny lives, go, goes and lives with Anna in New York, I'm pretty sure. So that was how that was wrapped up. Then you have the reveal of the Fairview Strangler, which is a kid called Eddie, teenager. And we see these flashbacks of how everyone knows him. And he was a really sweet kid and they all kind of befriended him. And he was friends with, you know, like Lynette's twins. And he was friends with Danny and he worked, you know. So he's like, they kind of weave him in throughout the season. It kind of is maybe a little bit obvious that it's him because we don't really know him before this. I think he might have been in the season before, actually, maybe just a tiny bit. And he's actually Max from 90210. So I was like, what are you doing here? And his actor is married to Judy's actor in real life, which is so cute. Anyway, so it, it, I think I was still shocked, actually. I don't know if I guessed it was him. Maybe we did have an inkling that it was him, but the reveal was still really good either way. And he ends up killing his own mum. And it's like a big, like, huge storyline. And the big tension is that at the end, Lynette goes to see him. And they don't, like, discover that he's the killer. But then she goes into labour and he actually helps her give birth to her baby. And then she convinces him to turn, like, himself into the police, right? 
And that was crazy. That was so intense. It was really dark and it was really shocking, that storyline. But then also the Bolan storyline was really good and really intense. And there was like flashbacks and, you know, you're kind of piecing together what is the story here, which I also really liked. And also just aside from that, I really loved Angie. And I wish that she had been in it for longer because she's actually one of my favourite characters from Desperate Housewives. So yeah, I really liked this one. Okay, breaking into the top three. So at number three, I have season three, and this is the storyline with Orson and his mum Gloria and his ex-wife Alma. So at first, we're kind of led to believe that Orson is this big villain because he hits Mike with his car, right? And it's, they kind of plant these seeds of that he had killed his ex-wife and now that he's married to Brie, he's going to kill her as well. But then it actually turns out to be like a kind of complete misunderstanding and actually he was, I mean, he did still hit Mike with his car, so he's not totally innocent, but he was like the innocent one because the everything else had actually been orchestrated by his mum, Gloria, who's big evil, and his ex-wife, Alma, who's like kind of evil, but also just like really obsessed with him and like led on by Gloria, right? Gloria's the real mastermind here. And let me tell you, this one was wild. Like from the get-go, this one was absolutely wild and it had me hooked because they were making it seem like he had killed Alma but then Alma shows up and you're like oh my god she's actually alive so then it's like well what the hell is going on here then this storyline is actually ends up being a direct cause for the shooting that happens in the supermarket which is the um disaster episode for this season and because there's a death, which is Monique, who Orson was cheating on Alma with, and they end up killing her. And Mike went to that house. She was doing what he was doing work for Monique. Then they try to plant it on Mike and make it seem like Mike was the one who killed her. And that was why Orson hit him with his car because he saw Orson that night, right? And then, so yeah, so then it turns out that Monique was having an affair with somebody else, and then his wife then goes and does the shooting, and then so it's all like really intertwined and like just so well written then gloria tries to kill brie at the end of this season which is just insane and then they manage to save her in time but also alma then tries to escape because i think gloria had like locked her in the attic because she decided she didn't want to do this anymore she busts a window open climbs out onto the roof and then falls off of the roof and dies it's like some east ender shit it's crazy you may be thinking to yourself if this is such a banging season and storyline why is it only number three and for me, it has a really big downfall. And I think a lot of other people would agree with this. And it is the assault of Orson in this season. Alma and Gloria end up drugging Orson. They not only knock him out, but they also give him like a Viagra, I think. And then she proceeds to assault him, trying to get herself pregnant. And... They kind of make a joke out of this, which is just so unsettling and so gross. The whole, the fact that this even happened in the first place, I feel like was just way too extreme and way too far and just should never have been written into the script. But then for it to actually happen and then for it to be kind of like made as like a joke because, because of the gender dynamic, they kind of make it like a joke because oh he's the husband and like he's a guy and it really just invalidates the idea of there being a male victim as as we know you know victims are genderless and i just feel like if it had been the other way around this storyline would have been like absolutely slated and like well just as horrific but i think it would have gotten a lot more attention whereas I don't know, they, the way they talk about it, they kind of just brush it under the rug, which, like, for Orson would have been so insanely traumatic. So, that whole thing, I really, really don't like. I don't like that it was included. I don't like how they handled it. And I think a lot of people agree with that. And that is why, for me, I have to put it lower down, because that, for me, was just too much. That aside, I think, like I said, the storyline is really, really good. But for me, that just kind of really ruins it. And I really just hate that whole part of it. Okay, so then number two, we have Dave. And this is season five. Dave moves to Wisteria Lane as Edie's new husband. And this man is suspicious from the get-go, okay? And it turns out that his real motive for moving to Wisteria Lane is to avenge the death of his wife and daughter, 
who died in a car accident. And we find out that the cause of that car accident was actually Susan and Mike in their car driving. And because of like the stop sign or something like this intersection, they crashed into their car and they ended up dying. So Dave's revenge is to kill initially he thinks it's mike that did it and then he actually finds out that it was susan because mike ended up taking the fall for susan so like publicly he was the one that did it but then they actually find out that it was susan so then dave sets his sights on susan and the story basically wraps up when dave tries to recreate the crash but with mj in the car and mike being the one to actually drive and hit the car while susan has to watch but then he decides at the last minute, we actually see the crash, but then we see that MJ wasn't in the car and Dave changed his mind and took MJ out of the car. And this was so intense. It was so insanely intense. There were so many points where you're like, oh my God, this is it. He's going to do it. He's going to kill Mike or this is it. Like he's going to kill Susan. You know, it was just so, there were so many good suspenseful moments like that. Now I get that it wasn't a huge mystery because we basically knew Dave's motives for quite a lot of the season, but I actually, but I actually kind of liked this element because as the audience, like we were in on the secret, but none of the other characters knew it. So when these scenes were happening, you can sit there and be like, oh my God, this is so crazy. Like they don't know, they don't know what his plans are. Like, oh my God, is he actually going to like do it right now? And I actually quite enjoyed that change in dynamic. Neil McDonough, I think is how you say it. Um, the guy that played him, oh my God, he played him so, so insanely well. It was crazy. It was so tense. It was just absolutely incredible. So good. And then they had like the bar fire, which was crazy. And then him blaming the fire on one of the twins and the drama that came from that. And also the fact that when Edie finds out the truth about Dave, she then dies before she's able to tell anyone about it. So his involvement and this mystery directly leads to her death, which is crazy as well. And I think the only thing that I would change about this is that I wish they had brought him back, honestly. Um, because he doesn't die at the end so I feel like having him come back in a later season would have been insane or at least like to have mentioned him because it's really traumatic what Susan and Mike go through but then they just never talk about the fact that that happened ever again oh my god and when he killed the psychiatrist that was insane as well so good it was so good and in the number one spot I feel like I couldn't have put anything else I was very close to putting Dave in the top spot but I just felt like I couldn't. I had to go with Mary Alice from season one. So the mystery surrounds Mary Alice and why she decided to end her own life. We find out that she was actually being blackmailed by Martha Huber, but I don't think she was actually blackmailing her because she knew about the death. It was like something else, I think, was what happened. I haven't seen season one for so long, but she thought it was about this and she ended up taking her own life. We find out that the secret she was hiding was that she and Paul had actually taken Zach when he was a baby because his mother was a drug addict and they had either adopted him or were going to or something like that or maybe they just taken him, I can't remember. And basically Deirdre came to take him back and they, Mary Alice did not want to hand him over and she ends up killing Deirdre. They put her into a toy trunk and bury her under their pool. And that is what everyone is trying to figure out, right? And that is the reveal at the end. But because Mary Alice is dead, obviously she can't go to jail for it and everything just kind of like subsides. And honestly, this mystery was so great. There were so many twists and turns to it and so many things that like like came off of it. We had that that was the reason that Mike was there because that was also kind of a mystery. Like, what is he trying to figure out? But he was trying to figure out what happened to Deirdre, his girlfriend and, you know, where she went, if she was missing or if she had died. And then obviously we know that Mary Alice was the one that killed her. So that's the link there. And we find out that Mike is actually Zach's dad. So that was crazy as well. You know, you had the suspense with Paul and is he really evil? And then did he die when he went to prison? And then he ends up killing Martha Huber because she was the one that sent the note and that crazy drama. And then obviously Felicia comes and, and, and everything. And she fakes her death. We have that Paul almost ends up killing Edie because he thinks she was the one that wrote it. But actually, she just took the paper from Martha because she was staying at her house. 
So there was almost that mess up. I just feel like it is the quintessential Desperate Housewives story. It's the OG. It's the story that started it all. And not only is it obviously the first season, but it just really sets the tone for how the rest of the show is going to be with that big mystery that like runs along the season. And you have, this is how we're introduced to the girls and their friendship with Mary Alice really connected them to the mystery a lot more. And just so good, so good. And obviously you have Mary Alice is the narrator of the show and throughout the rest of the seasons she just narrates kind of like how Meredith Grey does that kind of style where she speaks like at the beginning and she speaks at the end whereas in this one because the plot line was about her her voiceover feels a lot more impactful and it you know was kind of her commentary as well on what was happening which was really interesting and fun and we don't obviously get that in the rest of the show and yeah I feel like it just absolutely set the standard and the format for the show and then it is still being called back to later on like obviously Paul comes back for his revenge and that's because of how everyone had treated him and what happened to him in this season with Felicia and Martha and Mary Alice's death um Mary Alice's death continues to affect the girls in later seasons and then ultimately cut to season eight and then Brie receives a note exactly like the one that Mary Alice received in this first season and so I feel like it just has such impact and it's just so so good okay guys so that is me ranking every single desperate housewives mystery from the one that i liked the least to the one that i liked the most and i would love for you guys to let me know in the comments if you agreed with my ranking if you didn't which ones did you really like which ones did you not like and yeah i will see you guys in my next video make sure that you like and comment and subscribe and what else um follow me on instagram i also have a vegan instagram if you guys are interested in that um yeah whatever you feel like you know join join the fam over here it's good it's a good time um i'm hoping to do more yeah like i said desperate housewives videos and i'll let you know when you will um kind of start branching out a little bit but obviously i would still be having my pll and gossip girl videos those are my staples those are my gals um but yeah so yeah i hope you guys enjoyed this video like comment subscribe and i will see you in my next video bye